Hey, we're uh, here in Brooklyn across from Studio B with um, Tim, Dan, and Mitchell from Cut Copy. Um, how are you guys doing? Very well. Very well. Very well. Very well. It's a beautiful day here in uh, Brooklyn. I want to. I'm curious about um, about Australia and Melbourne. Like you guys have done fairly well, like in pop charts there, right? Um, with yeah. the newest album. Yeah, then, like debuted at number and, one at yeah. the Aria charts, which is just like a weird thing for us. You know, <laughs> yeah. when we started out, like we couldn't even get shows in Australia or like radio and play. Record, and it certainly, was never in the charts. I'd say we would have sold more records the first week um, of this one coming out than we did with the whole of the the last record. Like so. There's no way we were expecting to, to even sort of be in the charts anywhere significant, let alone sort of be at number one. So it was a bit of a surprise. Mm. What, what are the charts like there? Is, is there anything going on there that well, isn't anywhere else? No, I mean, we were lodged in between Rihanna yeah. and um, Jack Johnson. I think that's okay. who we beat that week. So I don't think the yeah. charts are that much different. Our charts are pretty, pretty commercial, but it's sort of been in the last... Um, in the last year or so that um, some sort of smaller bands have started getting up there in the charts. Like, um, I think our, our friends Midnight Juggernauts maybe came in in the 20s or something, and that was sort of really surprising. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I think something shifted, um, you know, pretty drastically recently. It seems like um, at some point after Avalanches were mm. first coming out that um, we were hearing a lot more Australian acts yeah. here. Um, I don't know, if, did, did that, did they sort of change things or were, we, they we'll did for us. They're changing for us, definitely. Yeah. They're, they're probably our biggest influence, yeah. both you know musically and like their live shows back then were just like the most insane things you'd ever see. Like they were breaking legs on stage and destroying things. It was like it was like a punk show or something. But seeing an act that I guess perhaps has sort of um, you know a less conventional um, sort of format and kind of plays stuff that people dance to, um, but does it live. Like I guess that was something that we'd never really seen in Australia before. Like, do you still feel uh, rooted in the in the Melbourne scene? Um, to a degree, but it, it feels like um, we kind of started out playing sort of shows at sort of you know, fairly small venues and were sort of part of the local thing. I guess probably we've maybe outgrown it in a way, um, just because we've been doing so much overseas touring and um, perhaps not at home as, as much as we used to be. But there's still a lot of great acts sort of in Melbourne and just sort of playing, you know, smaller shows and that sort of thing. I always sort of try and, um, you know, get along to as many shows when I'm back home just because it's sort of, you know, it's what, where we started. So, um, you know, it's sort of good to keep a finger on sort of what's happening. I'm curious about how you, how you navigate, like, your, your music is something that people connect to, to certain styles and things like sort of 80s revivalism that goes on and, you know, this sort of indie, indie dance area. Um, but I always feel like your music doesn't really feel solidly tied to any of these mm. things. It's kind of doing its own thing. Um, is that something that you're ever conscious of? Like how you relate to like trends and genres that are going on? There's some pressure that we put on ourselves not to sound like other people. Like to be honest, there's probably obviously familiar elements and people sort of pick up on that. You know, we love, you know, say shoegaze guitars or ELO or, you know, um, Krautrock or Daft Punk, for instance. But, um, but I think, you know, in the end we're trying to create something that that hopefully sounds uniquely ours and perhaps doesn't necessarily um, sort of relate directly to, to any of our influences. It sort of, um, you know, ends up being something that, that's sort of its own thing. I guess that's what we tried to do with the record rather than sort of having sort of individual songs that might sound like something. We tried to create something that as a whole kind of flows and almost, you know, doesn't stop from start to finish. And the, the, the project sort of started with you, right? Um, and so. how you were involved fairly early? Probably halfway through the process of writing, you know, Bright Like Neon Love. And then even then when we recorded that album and Dan kind of took it to Paris to mix, we didn't really know what we were doing and what we were going, like whether this was going to be a band thing or we just kind of put this show together and then played a few shows and then thought, oh, hang on, there's maybe something here. And, and then it just kind of continued on from there. I guess there was sort of that, maybe the initial blueprint for what, what we do now was probably there at that point, just the idea of maybe having sort of studio sort of program and recorded stuff and then combining that with kind of, you know... Really lo-fi, yeah. <laughs> poor, poor musicianship and yeah, that sort of thing. Totally. Um, but I mean, that, that's, that's still, I guess, in a lot of ways, the dynamic in our music. Do you ever have trouble, like, um, sort of translating things live? I think this record's a lot um, closer to the way we sound live, perhaps in our first one, because, um, like Tim was saying before, we, when we um, recorded that first album, um, we maybe played two shows live. So I think, our, you know, as far as our live show, they hadn't really developed to, um, you know, into what it actually was was going to be. 
Um, whereas I think having toured for a few years um, doing this one, and, and also I guess recording it um, uh, in the studio with Tim Goldsworthy, like uh, he really sort of ended up, I think, getting us to sound the way that we do live. I, I read that you guys spent like maybe a total of a day or two in the studio on the first album. For um, recording, yeah. Not yeah. even, it was like, actually, Half a day. yeah, we, we just, for recording our live instruments, I think we spent, yeah, maybe three or four hours in a studio, like did the whole record. Obviously we'd spend a lot longer writing it, so yeah. it wasn't like- um, And there's home recordings. Yeah, yeah, lots of stuff that was recorded at home, like all the electronic stuff and, and you know, sample material was sort of done at home. Whereas with this one, you, you were here living in New York for two months working on it? In Pretty the DFA much. studio, right? Yeah, yeah, so I guess just having that time, I don't know, we just felt more like a band, I think being in the studio and you know, I think that really comes across in the record, you know, we sound more like a band and just the, the amount of time we got to spend on texturing and layering the record, you know, which is something Tim really pushed us in that direction. And um, yeah, it was great to have that much time and also access to all the DFA's toys and gear yeah. and the coffee like, machine, whatever. Although it still felt like, you know, we were sort of, um, sort of pushing it to finish everything that we wanted to do in the time we had, you know, if we had another month, we would have used it, I'm sure. Although it felt like, I don't know, just having that time, I felt like we were doing something slightly more legitimate than perhaps the last record. Just, just having time to yeah. record and actually focus on what you're doing, I think probably helped us sort of layer tracks and, and kind of just add a lot more that we perhaps would have liked to with the first record, but just without the sort of money or time or know-how, like we just sort of couldn't really do it. So, so it was great having the opportunity. Here's a question somebody wanted me to ask you. Is, um, is it hard to look cool playing keyboards? <laughs> what do you mean? Because <laughs> um, you know it's a different thing with stage presentation a little bit, and I'm just. Uh, <laughs> Dan looks all right. He thrusts you, you, a little bit. <laughs> you might have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> we saw glass candy, and that look. I've never seen somebody like uh, look so cool playing keyboards. I don't know. You, Dan's sort of somewhere in between. Okay. It's hard to mosh playing keyboards. Yeah. Put it that way. <laughs> that's, that's one thing I've struggled with. Yeah. And you use fairly small ones, right? Like. like uh, I'm not sure which ones you use, like a Prophet and a Moog and... Um, well, yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff at home, but we, we tour with a sort of more pared down version of, of, um, of like the home studio setup. Because, okay. you know, I'd be too scared to take any of my vintage keyboards out on the other <laughs> road. They're like my children. I'd you know, yeah. be afraid that, you know, be led astray or something. <laughs> you, have, you have a lot of them at home? Yeah, like I mean, I, I just started collecting, I guess. Um, like doing the first record when I went to Paris, I, I just got really inspired seeing um, Philippe Zidar from Cassius, he had like this amazing collection of stuff and vintage sort of analog um, studio gear as well. And, um, and I guess I just sort of, ever since then, I've been slightly obsessed. Obviously going to places like DFA as well, you kind of um, can't help but be impressed by what they've got. So yeah, yeah. so yeah, I've got like my own modest version of that back in Australia. Thanks, thanks for spending time with us. No, thanks Pleasure. for taking the time out. Anytime. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs>